Well, if you worship today, could you tell the Lord about it? Express your worship to the Lord and say, God, we thank you. Let's applaud. Say hallelujah. Praise Jesus. Wow. And I, I meant that in my prayer, not that I have to qualify that. I hope I mean everything I say in my prayers. Amen. But uh, it is um, reminiscent, this experience just now is reminiscent of me hearing on more than one occasion, Iris Blue. You never knew who Iris Blue was or is. She was a converted prostitute that met Jesus as Savior. And for years at the big evangelism conference that they used to have here in Texas, we'd fill up Reunion Arena with thousands of people. And almost every year she'd share her testimony. Later in life, she was a big woman. She's almost six foot tall. And uh, she was... Uh, a confrontive kind of personality, sort of in your face, out of her lifestyle. And she'd tell her story about how she, because she was such a big woman, she always wanted to, she said, I used to imagine that one day a doctor would cut me open and a petite little lady would step out out of this old ugly body, is what she said. And she said, but I, she, she would say, I met a, a young man on the streets of Houston that, uh, shared Jesus with me and looked me in the eye and told me what I needed to do and knelt down with me on the sidewalk there in Houston, Texas. And she said, I knelt down a tramp and stood up a lady. Oh, and then she would sing a cappella, I'm a child of the king, just in a, in a uh, big voice, as, as only sometimes a big voice woman can. She would sing that just, I'm a child of the king. And often, I, I, I was glad they had the lights low in the stadium because I'd say, Lord, me too. I haven't been where she's been, but I've been where I've been, and that's bad in my heart. And God, me too. And I had this experience again this morning as Tiffany was singing and they're singing, me too, God. I can't sing it that way, but me too. And that's, a, that's the joy of worship today. Amen. Well, grab your sermon notes. That had nothing to do with what I'm going to say. <laughs> grab your sermon notes. And we are continuing this series entitled, I'm Glad You Asked. A question of forgiveness. Chris Carrier is his name, was his name. He was 10 years old on Friday, December the 20th in 1974. It was the last day of school, so they let him out early. He got on his bus to ride home, got off his bus, walking down the street, his street to his house, two two houses before he got to his house, he was met by a man on the street that said he recognized him, called him by name and said, Chris, he said, I'm a friend of your dad's and I'm, I'm preparing a party for your dad. I want you to come go with me so that we can, you can help me plan this party for your dad. So little Chris follows this man away from his house, down the street, around the corner to where he had his motor home parked. He gets into the motor home with this gentleman, and they drive out of the, out of the city. He finally tells the little, little Chris, he said, I, I really kind of lost my way, so they pulled over. And he gave Chris a map, you know, that's before all phones and everything. He said, unfold it, told him to look at certain numbers to try to find where they were. He was going to go to the back of the motor home to get something he needed. He came back. He took this little boy, laid him on the floor of his motor home. Uh, burned him numerous times with cigarettes and stabbed him repeatedly with an ice pick. The little boy saying, please, please stop. Please stop. Saying, if you will stop and let me go, I won't tell anybody. Well, he finally stopped and the man said, I'll tell you what, I'll take you to a place and drop you off and your dad can pick you up there. He drives out to the Everglades, gets him out of his vehicle, takes him to a spot and says, you sit down right there. And he shoots him in the head and leaves him for dead. If you could have spoken to that little boy after that experience, would you say, son, if you're going to move forward in your life, what you need to do is learn to forgive that man. Are there limits to forgiveness? That was the question that Peter asked. In, in our scripture today, turn with me, please, to Matthew chapter 18. Peter asked that very question. When is enough enough? 
Matthew 18, verses 21 through 35. Let's stand together as we honor the reading of the Lord's word this morning. Matthew 18, beginning with verse 21. Then Peter came and said to him, Lord, how often shall my brother sin against me and I forgive him? Up to seven times? Jesus said unto him, I do not say to you up to seven times, but up to 70 times seven. For this reason, the kingdom of heaven may be compared to a certain king who wished to settle accounts with his slaves. And when he had begun to settle them, there was brought to him one who owed him 10,000 talents. But since he did not have the means to repay, his Lord commanded him to be sold along with his wife and children and all that he had in repayment to be made. The slave, therefore, falling down, prostrated himself before him, saying, Have patience with me, and I will repay you everything. And the Lord of that slave felt compassion and released him and forgave him the debt. But that slave went out and found one of his fellow slaves who owed him a hundred denarii and seized him and began to choke him, saying, Pay back what you owe. So his fellow slave fell down and began to entreat him, saying, Have patience with me, and I will repay you. He was unwilling, however, but went and threw him in prison until he should pay back what he owed. So when his fellow slaves saw what had happened, they were deeply grieved and came and reported to their Lord all that had happened. Then summoning him, his Lord said to him, You wicked slave, I forgave you all that debt because you entreated me. You asked me, Should you not also have mercy on the fellow slave, even as I have mercy on you? And his Lord, moved with anger, handed him over to the torturers, until he should repay all that was owed him. So shall my heavenly Father also do to you, if each of you does not forgive his brother from his heart. May the Lord bless the reading of his word. You may be seated. Jim, I have a little echo or ring up here. If you could help me out there. Well, if we're gonna if we're gonna find God's answer to this question about the limits or extent of forgiveness, we need the first come to some clear understanding about the, its application. A little boy was sitting on a park bench in obvious pain one day. A man walked by and said, said to him, what's wrong, son? The little boy said, I'm sitting on a bumblebee. The man said, well, then why don't you get up? The boy replied, because I figure I'm hurting him more than he's hurting me. I wonder how often we treat forgiveness like that. We hang on to a bitterness because we, we want to hurt them more than they've hurt us. But we've discovered it doesn't hurt them at all. It's just hurting us more all the time. Well, if, we gonna, if we're going to understand this idea of forgiveness, for, first of all, we're going to have forgiveness explained. What does it mean? You know, it's mentioned 108 times in the Scripture. What does God mean when he talks about forgiveness? You'll see these definitions. This is from the... The Greek meaning of the word in uh, Scripture, forgiveness, it means to discharge, to acquit, to give up, to release a debt or a sin, to pardon. It implies giving up an inward feeling of injury or resentment toward the offender and release of debt for the offense. Notice those two parts. So forgiveness relates to the deed and the doer of the deed. Forgiveness, as you'll see again, is first rooted in our relationship to the grace we have received and our obligation to share that grace with others. The essence of all Christian forgiveness is anchored first in the fact that we are forgiven people. Our past cannot be changed by forgiveness, but the effects of the past can be changed through forgiveness. Which means our past can't be changed, but our future and our present can be changed if we learn to forgive. But often when we think of the term forgiveness, we can instinctively think of wrong things. That it may mean other things which are not right. The implications of if we forgive, then what about this situation or that circumstance? Or what about if the person did this thing? Well, I like what one writer put it. He's he's talked about Uh, Some people think forgiveness is the equivalent of excusing the action, saying that what was wrong is now right. No, that's not what forgiveness means. Uh, When Jesus displayed forgiveness, when he was encountered by the mob who brought the woman that was caught in adultery to him, uh, he chose not to stone her. However, he never, never did he excuse her either. 
What did he say? Go and sin no more, is what he said. So let me give you a list. You won't see it on your screen about for, what forgiveness is not, what it's not. But often these are the very things that we think is what it is. Forgiveness is not circumventing God's justice. It, it is allowing God to execute his justice in his time and in his way. That's very distinctive. Not in your time and not in your way, but in God's. Forgiveness is not waiting for time to heal all wounds. Hear me. Time doesn't do anything. It's what we do in the time that makes the difference. For some people, time only makes it worse because they stew on the issue of bitterness. Forgiveness is not letting the guilty off the hook. It's moving the guilty from your hook to God's hook. And that's a better place for it. Forgiveness is not the same as reconciliation. It takes two for reconciliation. Only one for forgiveness. Forgiveness is not excusing unjust behavior. It is acknowledging, uh, acknowledging that unjust behavior is without excuse while still forgiving. Forgiveness is not explaining away the hurt. It is working through the hurt. For forgiveness is not based on what's fair. <laughs> it was not fair for Jesus to hang on the cross, but he did so so that we could be forgiven. Forgiveness is not being a weak martyr. It's being a strong Christ-like Christian. Forgiveness is not stuffing your anger. It's resolving your anger by releasing the offense to God. Forgiveness is not a natural response. It is a spiritual, supernatural response empowered by God. Forgiveness is not denying the hurt. It is feeling the hurt and releasing the hurt. Forgiveness is not being a doormat. If so, Jesus Christ was the biggest doormat there ever was. Forgiveness is not conditional. It is unconditional. Now hear me. Forgiveness, the offer of forgiveness is unconditional. The acceptance of, uh, of forgiveness is conditional on repentance and faith toward God and maybe towards others. You see the difference? The offer of forgiveness is unconditional. Jesus Christ died on the cross 2,000 plus years ago offering forgiveness before we were born to have sinned, to have needed his offer to come. He was offering his forgiveness before we needed it. But he was anticipating what he knew we would need so that when we came along, we could accept his forgiveness through repentance and faith. Forgiveness is not forgetting. It is necessary to first remember so that you can forgive and then move on. Forgiveness is not a feeling. It's a choice, a decision of the will. You know, what's interesting about this question is the person asking it. It's the apostle Peter. Don't you just love Peter? I mean, it seems like in Scripture the only time he opens his mouth is to change feet. He's always stepping in it, so to speak, over speaking, over extending himself. But this sounds like a pretty good question. But you notice very quickly how he frames it. And folks, this is exactly what you and I would do. You see, he, in this, he is indicating that there, he's inferring that there's limits to forgiveness. You see what he's saying? He said, Jesus, I, I, I know there's limits. We can kind of get that settled. I'm just trying to determine where they are. How far do I need to go? What's the extent of that? How far is too far? The understanding of limits really comes from the uh, uh, rabbinical teaching of his day, the Jewish teaching, which said uh, the Jewish people, the Jewish teacher said three times, and then you're done. After three times, you're not required or obligated to forgive. You choose to, may choose to, that's fine, but it's optional after three times. Now, a part of the implication of that. Is, is in the context of the Jewish community. You'll notice that Peter says, if my brother sinned against me, the implication is Christian community, Christian brotherhood. 
In the Jewish context, it would be a fellow Jew, the three-time rule. And the implication is, if a person comes and says, I'm sorry for such and such, and you go, you're forgiven. And they come back with the same thing, I'm sorry for such and such. Well, okay, you're forgiven. And they come back the third time, and I'm sorry for the same thing, and you go, you're forgiven. And then they come back again, what's your a perception going to be? They're not really sorry because they keep doing the same thing. And so after three times, you don't really mean it, and no more forgiveness for you. <laughs> really? Before you jump on that bandwagon too quickly, please don't answer publicly. But let me ask you, have you ever had to go to God repeatedly about the same thing? Don't, don't, you don't have to answer publicly. To go to God, to go to God, to go to God and say, Lord, here I am again about this same thing. Have you figured it out yet? We are addicts. We are addicted to sin. It's our compulsion. If we, will need, if we were needle marked as a result of it, there wouldn't be a hardly a space left that didn't have a puncture hole because we're, we are compulsive sinners. It reminds me, I, I, I know I told you about a guy that I knew that, that uh, was addicted to cigarettes. And he was in his 50s. His lungs had already been destroyed. He'd have to go in the hospital to get breathing treatment. He would go in the hospital for breathing treatments. They had put him on oxygen because his lungs were so affected by, the, by, by smoking. He would get off the oxygen mask in his hospital room, go into the bathroom, and smoke a cigarette. I remember going to, when, when I did a wedding for his son and daughter-in-law, he could not be there because he was in the hospital, again, for breathing treatments. When he went home, they had to, he went around with an a, 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 a oxygen tank. And I sat in his house one time. And I said to him, man, why don't you quit? Man, mid-50s, he broke down and wept like a baby. He said, Pastor, I'm addicted to these things. Compulsion. You can go, well, well, you know somebody quit. You used to smoke, you quit. Oh, fine. What is your compulsion? Peter's asking a serious question, isn't he? But, you, but notice, too, how he frames the question he's framing the question uh, assuming he's the bestower of grace and some other poor soul poor fool is the one who's needing grace if someone offends me you know that's how we like to frame it you know if i'm going to execute justice towards somebody what's the limits of uh, what's the limits of grace toward that person when justice is said okay that's enough because i'm the one they've offended me why didn't he flip it the other way around? Why didn't he say, Lord, if I've offended somebody, what's the limits by which they could forgive me? No, 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 no. If we're the offender, we want all the grace we can get. Isn't that the truth? We want all the grace we can get. But if I'm someone's offended me, then what are the limits by which I can extend grace to others? Aren't we hypocrites? You notice... Uh, if three times is the charm in the rabbinical community, and Peter says, uh, Lord, what's the limits? Is it seven times? He doubled it and added one. Man, you can see, man, he's being bold. He's stepping out there. I'm taking what the Jewish rule was, and I'm doubling it and adding one. Surely that's going to be enough. And Jesus said, not so much. How about 70 times seven? What is that? 490 times, that's right. Now, is Jesus saying, it's a lot more than you think, Peter, but there is a place to stop? Really? What would that require? Would Jesus be saying, okay, everybody's got to go to Walmart and get you a little notepad, get you a little notepad that'll have a pen to, or, uh, no, 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 no. I'm sorry, that's old timey. There's an app for it now. <laughs> the, the, the Keep Record of Forgiveness app, you know. And, uh, but you got to put a name by every one of those because everybody gets 490 times, you know. And you go, oh, 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 
Hang on a second. Okay, you're 27, dude, man. You're 27. You know, you imagine, you'd have to be, it'd have to be somebody in the family, you know, your brother or sister or you know, that you've known 49 years. You go, okay, man, you're up to 263. I've kept a record. Is that what Jesus is saying? No. He's saying it's infinitely more than you could ever imagine. You can't keep up with the number of times that you need to forgive. Why? Because you need the same grace. Oh, what a picture. What an explanation of forgiveness. Well, forgiveness to be explained, but also forgiveness experienced. How do we experience in 1 John 1, 9? It says, we confess our sins, and he's faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. To experience forgiveness, repentance is required. Forgiveness is a gift to the guilty who admit their guilt, but it's not required for forgiveness to be extended. Now, this is an interesting thing. After Jesus said 70 times 7, which is Peter going, forget keeping records, it's more than you can ever keep up with because it's an ongoing thing. The same grace you need, so does that person that's offended you. And then Jesus said, it reminds me of the kingdom of heaven. There was a king who had two servants or two slaves, and he's, it's, it's accounting day. So he calls his slave in, and he says, okay, I've looked at your account. It's time to balance the books, and it looks like you owe me 10,000 talents. 10,000 talents. I'll not do all the figures for you, but I will round it. 10,000 talents, by some calculation, in that time, was somewhere between 58 and 80 pounds of gold. 58 and 80 pounds. They said back then it was basically measured by the, the average weight of a person. You could tell they weren't Americans, right? They were thin <laughs> Asians or whatever. So let's say it's 80 pounds. So you got 80 pounds of gold times 10,000. 800,000 pounds of gold, how many ounces to a pound? So that's 16 times 800,000 pounds of gold. I know somebody's over here calculating it already. Uh, then then you, you take that number and multiply it by, if the, if the, go, the value of gold is $1,300 an ounce, I did some calculations. I came up somewhere between 16 billion, 280 million dollars of debt. You know what that means? It's an infinite indebtedness. Now, some people suggest that the only inference that Jesus could be making would be if you have a king and a, you have a slave under a king that was a provincial governor. So you had a governor. It was a, he was a servant to the king, and the gover, governor, where does he get his money? Taxes. So if he's getting taxes and not sending it on, but in all calculations, there was not that much money in a province. Any of the governors under that day, that they, none of them had collected a tenth of that amount during any time. So Jesus is saying, if this guy owes the king an infinite amount of debt, it's an infinite amount of debt. It's unimaginable. It's mind-blowing. I mean, uh, I don't know how you multiply that in, in uh, Greek figures or Roman. They, it's too much. And yet this guy goes, don't throw me in prison. Because what would it mean? If he's thrown in prison, he doesn't get paid. It's not like American prisons. <laughs> he doesn't get paid. And so if he's in prison and he's suffering, and he can't pay it, that means you're going to suffer forever for a debt that's too big for you ever to repay. And then he goes, oh, king, please, could you tap the brakes? I probably, listen, I, I, please, mercy. King goes, okay. Wipe the debt clean. This guy leaves the king, and he goes to his servant, and he says, you owe me denarii. So many denarii, it's a daily wage amount. And uh, based on calculations, however, however the, the equation is, maybe, maybe this guy owed him about $4,000. He 
He owed the king billions, an unimaginable amount. This guy owes him. It's, it's pretty good. But it's conceivable there could be a way to pay it back. He goes, please, please, mercy. Nope. You either got it today or you don't. You're going to jail, and I'm done with you. Again, if he's in jail, he'll suffer forever. He can't pay it back. And then Jesus says, of course, the story is, the word gets around to the king about the first guy, and he calls him in and said, the, 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 the mercy you received, you should have given to another, and therefore, I'm going to make you pay, not only just in prison, but you're going to be tormented. You're not just going to sit around twiddling your thumbs. You're going to be tormented. What's the inference here? Forget the money. Forget the money. Picture it in our relationship with God. And the debt is sin. And we have an indebtedness of sin towards God. Because ultimately, when you sin against a holy, infinite being, that's an infinite indebtedness. We have sins we cannot pay for. Matter of fact, the implication is death in hell and eternity separated from God will never, ever, 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 ever. It will take forever, which is forever, and it's not ever paid back. And yet Jesus sent his son, God sent his son Jesus, died on the cross, and his eternal death, took place of our eternal damnation. And when we receive it by faith, our indebtedness is wiped clean and we're forgiven. This is the implication. If God has forgiven us of an infinite indebtedness of sin, anything, anyone, could ever, would ever, in a lifetime of misery, do towards us is nothing in comparison to the grace that God's extended us, our indebtedness towards him compared to this little offense here. You see the difference? It's incomparable. It's inconceivable that this slave, servant, or us as Christians who have received the infinite mercy of God should ever feel like we have a right to hold something over somebody else's head. Pretty sobering, isn't it? Well, what about forgiveness expressed? You see, if we're gonna if we're gonna experience forgiveness, we have to repent, receive it of God, but then to express God's mercy through us. Being a forgiving person is testimony that you are a forgiven person. Matthew 6, 14 through 15 says, For if you forgive others for their transgressions, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you do not forgive others, then your Father will not forgive your transgressions. Luke 6, 37, Do not judge, and you will not be judged. And do not condemn, and you will not be condemned. Pardon, and you will be pardoned. Ephesians 4, 32, Be kind one to another, tenderhearted, forgiving each other, just as God in Christ also has forgiven you. What did Jesus say from the cross? Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. What did Stephen say when he was being stoned to death? Lord, lay not this sin to their charge. Could he, was Stephen saying his words would eradicate that? No, he was expressing his heart about what he hoped that they could experience, which is forgiveness. What does an unforgiving spirit do? An unforgiving spirit inhibits your Freedom to fully worship God. An unforgiving spirit inhibits our freedom to worship God. What does the scripture say? If you have an offering and you're going to bring it to the altar and you have aught with your brother, park, tap the brakes. You leave your offering, you go back and get right with your brother, and then you come and bring the offering to God. Get all of these relationships The scripture says, as much as possible, live at peace with all men. As much as we can do our part. Remember, reconciliation takes two, but forgiveness just one. How we relate to each other here is a testimony to this relationship and also affects how we have this relationship. An unforgiving spirit robs us of the joy of the Lord. 
it robs us of the fullness of our forgiveness in Christ. Unforgiving spirit creates resistance to the continuing work of God in our life. Our ability to hear freely and respond deeply and be sensitive to his spirit. An unforgiving spirit replays the pain many times over, corrupting the present with the past. Have you ever known somebody that they took that misdeed, whatever, a word, a deed, money paid, owed, whatever, and they play that over and over and over and over and over again? I've talked to people. I, I've, I've talked to people in their 70s telling about the offenses that they had in their family when they were children. My sister did this. My brother did that. What a waste of time. What a waste of joy. What a waste of the freedom of the grace of God that he died to take all that junk away. Let it go. Let it go to fully experience. I want you to hear me. If you could have spoken to little Chris, would you have said you need to forgive? I told you he was left for dead, but he did not die. A deer hunter found him, shot in the head, multiple stabs with ice pick, cigarette burns over his body. Amazingly, he did not suffer any brain damage. And also, he lost the use of his left eye because of where the bullet went. He was blinded for the rest of his life. He went on to receive Christ as his Savior and Lord. In time, he met a young woman. They got married, had two children. And in, in la a few years later, he was serving as a youth minister in a Presbyterian church in Florida. At the age of 32, he got a call from the police department. They said, Chris, there's a man 77 years old his last name is McAllister. He's dying in a nursing home, and he's confessed to having been your captor. Chris started visiting this man. He was blind at the time. He was emaciated, weighed about 60 pounds, yet he was lucid. He could talk to him, and Chris, in those first conversations, began to identify himself. First, the man was distant, and then he tried to identify himself. And then in a short time, the man said, I'm so sorry for what I did to you. Chris would, kept visiting him and started reading the Bible to him and sharing Christ until his captor, Mr. McAllister, trusted Jesus as his Savior and Lord. Some people ask Chris, "Why? how in the world... Could you have forgiven this guy who did that to you? And he said, listen, I'd let that go a long time ago. He said, if I, if I wasn't willing to forgive, I wouldn't be the man that my wife married or the dad that my kids know today. I wouldn't be who I am now if I wasn't willing to forgive. You know, when recently when that brother... Uh, on the witness stand here in Dallas uh, just a couple of weeks ago, pronounced forgiveness to that police officer that had killed her brother and said, I forgive you. I don't want any harm to come to you, and I hope you give your life to Jesus Christ, and then asked to embrace her. And that went all over the news, that brother embracing his, his brother's killer and saying, I forgive you. You know, society looks at that and goes, is he crazy? I mean, why wasn't he screaming, uh, no justice, no peace? Why wasn't he saying, uh, no, 10 years, are you kidding me? It ought to be life. It ought to be the electric chair. It ought to be this, that, and the other. And the society's going, we don't get it. They take a pause and go, that's crazy. That's ri ridiculous. That's weird. Where is that? Folks, in the, in the body of Christ, that ought to be everyday business. That's not unusual for a person who's fully experienced their debt being paid. 
and they give that grace to others. Oh, I could tell you numerous stories. Again and again, the very same kind of thing where people who've been harmed by somebody forgives them. There was a picture years and years ago. I believe it was on the front of what used to be Life magazine. Those of us who are old enough, it used to be a big magazine that always had great pictures about what's going on in the world. And toward the end of the Vietnam War, there was a classic picture. The photographer won a, a prize for this snapshot. It was a road coming out of a tree of a village, a wooded area. Flames are burning in the background. And there's a 10-year-old girl running down this road, totally naked because her clothes have been burned off her body. She's been burned, and there's an anguish. It looks like it's been raining or something. There's, there's a screaming, this anguish on her face. Her arms are up. And that's the snapshot. Because a napalm bomb, which blows up in flames, landed on her village and and caught everything on fire. You say, how in the world? What is she supposed to do with that emotional scar? Well, she lived through that experience. Grew up and trusted Jesus as her Savior and Lord. Some years later, she was speaking at the Vietnam Memorial because people back then remembered her picture as that little girl. And at that Vietnam Memorial speech, she said, if I could meet the guy that flew that plane that dropped that flaming bomb on my village, she said, I'd forgive him today. Turns out he was there. He had heard she was going to talk. And he went... To that, through that crowd, and he found that lady, and he said, I was the pilot that dropped that flaming bomb on you. He said, they told me there were no civilians in the area. That's what he said. But he said, I'm so sorry. He broke down and wept like a baby, and she came over, and she hugged him, and he repeated again, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. And she said, I forgive you. I forgive you, I forgive you. I could tell you story after story after story of that. That's what God's people are about. Hear me. Justice is in God's hands. Forgiveness is out. Listen, if if we got if everybody got justice, no one would receive mercy. But because we have been forgiven, we forgive and leave the justice to God. Let's bow together in prayer. My Heavenly Father, every day somewhere somebody's offending someone. We are offending someone. Someone is offending us. Help us to Let your forgiveness flow. It doesn't start with us. Help your forgiving grace flow through us to them. If we get to express it, fine. If we should express it, fine. But God, sometimes people don't know they've done things that's offensive. We just forgive them in our spirit. Let it go. God, I pray that if there's there's historic hurts that we haven't learned to release, I pray in the name of blood of Jesus that you would help us to say, God, Only by your grace, I ask you to forgive me and release me and help me to release that person from that indebtedness. God, I pray that you would, if there's a a response, if we need to come to the altar, turn that pew or that seat into an altar, God, help us to do it. Help us to be free. Help us to walk out of this place free. It's not about them changing. Maybe they don't even know. Maybe they don't even agree. None of that matters. I can be free because you've made me free indeed. Holy Spirit of God, help us to live and walk in the grace that's been given us. To share that grace with others again and again and again and again. God, because of your grace to us. Thank you, God for not keeping a score, for not having a limit, 
and having more than enough always. In Jesus' name I pray.